identity. He always starts off letters telling people who I am. Because I don't need y'all to define me because y'all can't define me. Y'all can't put me in a box because I was made outside of the box. Actually, after God made me, he broke the mold, literally, because we're each individuals. We're each unique. But the one thing we do have in common is that we were made by God. Hello everyone and welcome to Connection Bible Fellowship. My name is Charmaine. I am just a servant of the Lord trying to get his word out to as many people as possible to bless them, to empower them and connect them through the word of God. And so today we are starting a new series, super excited, and it's in the book of Colossians. This series is going to be called The Kingdom Handbook because this series, uh, is based on the book of Colossians and uh, it's jam packed with what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. What it, what, what does the kingdom of God even mean? How do I walk this out? How do I live this out? Is this real? Is it realistic? And I'm here to tell you it is. And so the book of Colossians is what we're going to be in today. So Paul goes on to extend grace and peace. The grace and peace of God he extends to the readers of the letter. Paul is very distinct to clarify into the intro who God is. Paul distinctly says the Father and the Lord Jesus the Messiah. This is a basic truth about God. That God is both the Father and he is uh, the, the son of God who is Jesus. And so he's, he's being very distinct and he is also the Holy Spirit. So let us go to verses three to four. I had a little trouble reading. So I'm going to put this on and it says, we give thanks to the God and father, our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. So I love this because Paul, you know, he just, he just so, he's so specific in how he does these things. He always gives credit where credit to do. And he starts that way. He starts out that way. He don't start out bashing. He don't start with the one, two punch, the two piece combo. He starts out giving praise. He starts out complimenting, okay? Um, He doesn't hold back on it either. I pray always for y'all, the saints and the brethren. I mean, he go all in. He making you feel real good about yourself. You know what I'm saying? And so, and and I like the fact that he's giving praise. He's giving encouragement towards one another. I like that, but I wonder if we are reflecting that in our daily lives. In our daily lives, and we have disagreement, because this letter is basically about to also tell people what you're not doing right and how you need to do it to be pleasing to the Lord. Okay? Again, still not a condemnation, but it should be a conviction. And so this letter may say some things that may be a little harsh, a little rough, but guess what Paul does? He's setting up the soil. He's toiling the soil. He's breaking it up. So that you not the, the person who's receiving the message is not going to be so hard-hearted to and be on the defensive. Paul is giving praise. Paul is saying, you know, uh, you know, thanks be to God for you guys. You're doing so much. Your faithfulness. He's he's he, he's not buttering them up, but he's all he's looking at the good points. He's not flattering them, telling them false false truths. What he's doing is he's telling them the good things that he sees. And anytime we go to talk to our brethren about things that may be a little harsh or a little bit rough around the edges, it shouldn't come out with the bashing, 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 bashing. It should come out with, okay, there's good and bad here. Let's focus on the good first because that's where, as a mind of a believer, that's where we should be first. We should be picking out the good. And so, and, and, and Paul quickly goes there and he doesn't hold any restraint. He doesn't say, I'm going to give him a little bit of praise. I ain't going to get him too much. I want them to get too hype. I want their head to get swole. No, he goes all in and gives them the praise and gives them the encouragement that he knows that they deserve it from what they are doing. Too often, we are quick to, uh, you know, tear people down and slow to build people up. 
And we need to be the opposite. We need to be quick to build people up and slow to tear people down. Or not at all. Don't tear people down. Don't tear people down. But you know what I mean in, in regards to sometimes you're going to say things. And the truth does hurt. But you can do it in a way that you're not tearing someone down. You're not tearing into who they are as a person. And so it's easy to sit back and point out the faults of others because we all have them. So we're very familiar with faults. We're very familiar with shortcomings. We all have them. We So we know we can look at something. Oh, look at that right there. Mm-mm, that ain't right. Cause of the, and listen, I am one of those people. I could be I, quick, quick. Ain't nothing. Take nothing. Because I have them. So I see them. But what always gets me is that other people don't see themselves. We don't see ourselves. We be quick to point out everybody else's faults. Quick to say how everybody else is not doing something right. But what about us? What are we falling short on that we want grace for? That we want to say, Lord, please overlook that time when I had. But then if somebody else does it, I can't believe that you did that. Oh my goodness. What are we doing? That is not the mind of God. And that's not how Paul sets it up. Even when he does other, other letters. And he, especially the book of Corinthians. He's going in on these. He's going in on that church. He does not even hold back. But what he does do. Is the same thing he does in this letter. He praises them and pulls out all the goodness first so that the person knows that Paul acknowledges you. Everything you did, not just the negative. And so we have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we behave, the way that we interact with one another. We want to make sure that we take time out to encourage. We take time time out to edify. That we take time out to build up. And I know that for a very long time, you know, most of us spent more than half of our lives um, in, in the darkness, you know, in the world. And so it's, it's hard to, to really, we have to really fight some time to see the light in people. We really do. Because this world is hard and it's heavy and there's things that happen in this life that really makes you just have no hope in people. Which we should not have full hope in people. We should just think the best of people. But... We kind of be like, Lord, everybody's evil, everybody's bad, you know, and we think like that because it's easier to kind of think black and white than to have gray. Because when you have gray, then you have to really start taking your time to get to know someone, judge each person by their character. But if I can easily put someone in a black and white box, whoo, that's quick and easy for me. But that's not how God is. And I'm going to tell you how that's not how God is. There was a time when, two times, there was one time when David, King David in the Old Testament, that he... Uh, basically slept and raped, you know, basically, I'm going to say raped, raped a young lady because he thought that she was fine. So he had her bring her over, he had, the, you know, his, his people bring them over, bring her over, and he had sex with her, even though he knew that she was married. According to God's law that was already given by that time, he should have been stoned and killed, but God had mercy on him. That's great. There was another time when David ate the showbread, which is this bread that was supposed to be out in the temple. And that is also another offense that you should be killed. Grace. God gave them, gave him grace. That's called, that's a gray area. So yes, God is black and white about some things, but a lot of things he's gray about because he has grace. What would be, if he was black and white about everything, there'd be no need for grace. You going to heaven, you going to hell. That's it. But there's grace. That's why we can't, condemn anyone because we don't know where God's going to place that grace and how he's going to use it. All we can do is tell people this is what the words say and that's that. But either way, back to what we were talking about. So because of that, because we spend so much time in the darkness, it really is a little bit hard for us to find the light, but the light is there. The light is there and we need to spend more time. And I, and I implore you and I encourage you spend a little bit more time this week as you're interacting with your family members, as you're interacting with your friends, your children, your spouses, and look for the light. Look for the light in them. I know they're not going to do things 100% and neither are you, but look for the light in them this week. And just see how your brain and how your mind starts to change view of that person. And so, you know, I, I, I implore you guys to do that this week, to build up someone this week, to encourage someone this week, and to edify someone this week. I think that if we did this more often, 
Um, I think that we'll have a more cohesiveness within the body of Christ. Well, Paul gives a great example here about a leader leading because Paul says that he prays for them always, always praying for them. And to me, that's a good example of a godly leader. He tells them that he's giving thanks to God for them, that he's praying for them always. Paul is taking seriously, he's seriously taking this into consideration the fact that someone came to him for advice on how to lead correctly, how to lead godly. And he knows that there's going to have to be some correction here. So he knows he wants to go to God for this correction. He wants to go to God to make sure that, where, how do I uproot this negativity that's been planted in this church? And so Paul is going first to God in prayer for these people. He's not just, um, he's not just, you know, saying off the top of my head, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do ABC. He's taking it very seriously that this person came to him for help and he's going to God, praying for them, giving thanks to God for them. That is what a godly leader is supposed to do. Paul is letting them know that God is involved in what he's about to say in this letter. Paul is letting them know up front that, hey, this is no willy nilly. I wasn't just sitting here in prison and playing tic-tac-toe and just decided to write this letter. I prayed about this. I invited y'all into my prayer time with the Lord. Because this is serious to me. Uh, he, Paul has sought the Lord on their behalf. Not just to, not just to um, uh, discipline them. But he sought the Lord on their behalf. To give thanks to them about the good things. That the Lord is using them to do. He's giving thanks to them. That, he, that these people are faithful. That these people are lovers of God. He's, and he's also seeking the Lord for guidance guidance so that what he's going to say to them is not just solely him that this is god as well there's also a lesson in here on how we should you know how how to address someone when there's an issue because there are issues people gonna have issues with me i'm gonna have issues with people that's just what it is right but how do you address someone do you immediately like i said go in and just start digging up all the dirt and the muck no Paul started off with praise. He started off with thanksgiving. He started off with prayer. Those are three things I would suggest. Three things I would encourage. That when you're going to talk to someone about an issue that you may have with them. One, first and foremost, pray. Pray. And as you're praying, praise God for them and the good things about them. Give thanksgiving to the Lord. Out for these people. So you want to make sure you're praying. Make sure you're praising. And make sure you're doing it all with thanksgiving. These three things will help you address this person in a godly way. Don't go quick to address someone right out of your emotions. Give yourself time to do these, th these three things. Pray. Praise. Thanksgiving. Pray. Praise. And thanksgiving. Very, very important. Then... When you go to this person and talk about this disagreement, you have had an opportunity to sanctify yourself, to sanctify your emotions, to make sure they're in line, they're in alignment with God and who he is and how he would address this. And so this way, it's not going to just benefit uh, that person because now you're able to talk. It's going to benefit you. Now you're in a better space. You're not, you know, all, you know, emotional about it. And the conversation will start off with those same things you prayed about. Because they're going to be fresh in your mind that, you know, I praise the Lord for this person for doing A, B, and C. And then you can start that conversation off like that. You know what? I really appreciate you to do A, B, and C. And I'm so thankful about A, C, D, and E. Whatever. And so this is a way that I think that we're, a we're able to have confrontational conversations about things that need to be talked about. But do it in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. Paul speaks of the church at Colossae about all that... He has heard about their faith and their love, their faith in Christ and their love for the saints. At this time, there's no internet, there's no um, social media, but Epaphras, he's the one that told Paul about them. He uh, is, a, you know, he told Paul about all the things that they're doing there. Their faith and love could be seen. Let me put that in. Their faith and love could be seen. It's not an invisible thing. This isn't, 
what, you know, somehow, I think somehow along the years, we might have uh, translated faith and love into some type of, I don't know, invisible thing, some mystical force, some metaphysical experience. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you that faith and love are things that can be and should be seen. And so, um, faith and love are actions. They're tangible, tangible experiences. Tangible means something you can see, feel, touch. You can, you can see that. As believers, we shouldn't go around uh, bragging and telling people about, oh, I, you know, yes, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, 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 yes. that is me. I'm holier than thou. Yes, yes. No, that's not what we should be doing. What we should be doing is living out a life of faith and love in such a way that we don't even have to speak about it. Someone will come and tell us about it. Like, you know what? You're different. The way you move. Because I saw the way that so-and-so talked to you and you was just like, are you? Are you all right? Or even because the way you handled that was so amazing. And that's your opportunity. That's your inroad. You don't have to stand on the corner with a sign that says, you know, John 316. If you want to, that's fine. But you don't have to. Because if you're living your life a certain way, if you're living your life in a way that benefits uh, I mean, that, that projects who God is. You're living a life that's full of faith. You're living a life that is full of love. And it's going to show and prove to people around you. And they're going to be able to see how you move. How you respond to hard times. How you respond in the face of fear. They're going to see what God has done in your life. And they're going to ask you about it. And that's how you witness to somebody. It's because of the life you live. And so we don't have to go around bragging because the kingdom of God is within us and we should be seen and it should be seen and it should be experienced by everyone everywhere we go because we bring the kingdom of God with us. And so let's move on to verses five through eight and then we should be able to close out. So five through eight. And he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned... From Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who is all who also declared to us your love in the spirit. So in verse five, Paul speaks of Paul speaks of hope. This hope that is laid up for us in heaven. My question was, what is that hope? You know, it sounds good and it sounds very poetic, but then I'm like, well, what is that? I don't know. But anyway, so I wanted to know what is this hope? And guess what? As I said that and I kept reading, <laughs> Paul answered it. And it's still in verse 5, but it says that we have heard in the word of the truth of the gospel. And what do we say the gospel was? The gospel is the kingdom message. What is the kingdom message? The kingdom message is... Jesus, the Messiah, dying for our sins, giving us access to, to God in heaven and the power of his spirit here on earth. That is the kingdom message. It's the good news. It's the gospel, the good news of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I'm sorry, in Jesus, the Messiah, by the grace of God, living empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to say that again because that was a little bit. The gospel is the kingdom message. The kingdom message is the good news of salvation by faith in Jesus the Messiah. By, by the grace of God. Living empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. This kingdom message is laced with the good news of freedom. It was sent into the world, giving hope to many, giving 
hope to people who were in bondage to this world, in bondage to sin. Now he's saying because of this good news, I have good news for you. You have salvation. You have freedom through Jesus. You have it. And even after that, you're going to get a bonus gift. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying there is some good news here. And by that good news, everything, all of these good things have been laid up for you. That hope that you're holding on to of the good news of salvation is in heaven, laid up waiting for you. The kingdom message is so powerful that it is still around today as, as it was then. It was bearing fruit then and that fruit that it bore then, it is the fruit that we're eating off today. And that we are still, you know, those people back in those days were searching, they were hungry and they were thirsty for something. They couldn't wait to hear something so good and they received it. And today... That is a plan that I can tell you that's a three-point plan to stay on your faith journey. To stay on your faith journey, to stay always walking with the Lord, you need to hear these three things. You need to do these three things all the time. And this is, a, I mean, this is what you need to do. It says that always we need to stay walking with the Lord. How do we do that? We need to stay searching his word. Search his word. Number one, search his word. Be in his word daily. Number two, stay hungry for his presence. Hungry for his presence. You should be like a deer panting by the water, right? That's what they say, panting by the water. That means, oh, I need it, I need it, I need it. Woo, I need me some water, so I, woo, I need it. We need to be like that with God's presence. So be in prayer, in his presence, just letting it, letting it. And then lastly, we need to be thirsty for a relationship with him. Thirsty, you know, obey your thirst. Obey the thirst of wanting to be in a relationship with God. Those three things, searching his word, hungry for his presence, and thirsty for a relationship with him. If those three things are done on a daily, continuous basis, you will be able to walk the walk of faith. With more ease. I didn't say perfect, but with more ease and less stress. And so as we're doing those three things, then we will see the kingdom message bear fruit in our lives. This is what Paul is telling the people at Colossae, that the kingdom message from what he's hearing is bearing fruit among them. That that, that day to day, he's hearing that from the day that they heard the word of God, that they were on fire for the Lord. They were on fire for Jesus. They were on fire for the kingdom message. This is what he's hearing. And today, I pray that this is true, not in just in my life, but in your lives, that you guys are on fire for Jesus. You're on fire for the kingdom message, that you are walking with him, that you want to be saturated with him. So that that kingdom message can bear fruit in your lives. That you're in a spirit that you're, you're in a spirit of, 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 of wanting to give out and to receive more from God. I mean, I don't, I'm not here to condemn anybody, but I am praying that the Holy Spirit, if you're not in that place where you're on, you're on fire for the Lord, that you're on fire with this kingdom message. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit convicts you today and puts you in a position that the kingdom message just lights you up and gets you in that place to where you can be bearing fruit. And so at the end of verse six, it says, as it is, sorry, as it is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. And so this struck me the, you know, what is he saying? Heard and knew. Can we hear something and not know it? Can we hear something and not know it? In this case, Paul is referring to the truth and grace of God. So far, far too many of us are so many of us. Um, we hear things, and it goes in one ear and out the other. And sometimes it may even be the word of God that we hear in one ear and go out the other. But we do know that in our spirits, there's something that may be missing. But we have to ask, what, what is it? What is it that, that is happening? You know, so when we hear the word, do we know it in our spirits? Is it being translated there? We hear the pain of others and what they're going through and what's happening. But do we take the time out to get to know them, to really know what's going on with them? 
Um, you know, to to listen, to listen to the information we're receiving. That helps us incorporate what we know into a level of understanding. And as we pointed out in another series about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, we know that once we have knowledge, we have the understanding, then that, that takes it to an even higher level, which is wisdom. And so we need to take that time out, not just to know the word of God. There are many people out here that can memorize scripture and living like I don't know what. There's many people out here that, that can read the Bible and still curse you out. So we're not just talking about knowing verses. We're talking about knowing it, listening, understanding. And the more that we do that, the more we'll be able to operate in the spirit. The more we'll be able to benefit from the kingdom of God and bring what is in heaven to earth. We can't do that if we're in a place where we're like, praise the Lord, how you doing? And somebody's like, fine, right as they're walking by. We don't even stop to say, oh, praise the Lord, how you doing? No, nah, nah, I'm doing, I'm not doing bad. I, you don't even know what they're saying because you then walked off. Or I have walked off, you know? So we want to make sure that we're listening. And listening is a skill. And it's a skill that can be learned and it's a skill that can be taught. And I'm learning to listen. Because a lot of times I don't listen. I gotta go, I gotta do things, I gotta do things. But I have to stop and listen. And sometimes this is even reflected in our prayer life. We're praying, oh Lord Jesus, ha, Lord, can please, please, you get this, can you please do it, get it, do it, Lord. <laughs> Amen. And we walk off. We walk off. Do we pray and then stop and say, all right, Lord, I'm going to just sit here in your presence just to hear you, just to listen to you. Because I, and I spoke for about 30 minutes about what I need. I want to hear from you. And we need to take that time after we pray, after we put our petitions before him, after we give him all our whole list of things that we want that ain't going right in our life. Sit and listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, even though I know in some of those movies, like the sky be cracking over, oh, and all that good stuff. But the Holy Spirit is gentle. Sweet. Like a still small voice. And we sometimes so in a rush. So doing so much that we cannot even hear. We cannot even hear the Spirit of the Lord. So I implore you to just listen. After you pray, just take a little, take a little time. Just sit there for a moment. And see what the spirit says to you. So lastly, uh, Paul speaks of Epaphras, the minister of this group of believers who are seeking, who he is seeking on their behalf. So Paul wants to talk about this guy who came to him asking to help him with these group of people. This is a sign of a good minister of God. This is a sign of a good servant of the Lord. Oh my gosh. Epaphras is not trying to handle this on his own. He's not saying, listen, I put this joint together. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to bust this out. He's saying, I need help. I need help from the gate. Somebody please help me. So he goes to someone, not just to anybody. He goes to a well-known person, someone that they, that they they talked about and said, this guy knows what he's talking about, bro. You need to go over there and talk to him. And he goes not just for himself, saying, oh, you know, Paul, I need help as a leader. Please help me, you know, because I want to get closer to the Lord. He's going on the behalf of all the people there. He's going on behalf of all the people there. And that is so important. A true leader of God is not going to just be seeking God for himself or herself. He or she is going to be seeking God for the people in which God placed in their or place um place them over, and so Paul is 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 I, again I don't know what Epaphras's uh state of being I don't know if he was young in the ministry if he was young in his faith was he new to this leadership game I don't know but he either way what I do know is that he didn't let his pride stand in the way he didn't say well I think I know what I'm doing he went and got help what I know is that he humbled himself. And this is a requirement of being a leader. A leader should not be prideful. A leader should be humble, willing to listen, 
always open to learning. A leader should never be at a place where they have arrived and they don't need to hear nobody else's opinion. No, they should always be looking to, to be, okay, I, I, I never thought about it that way. Let me, let me consider that. Let me take that before the Lord. Never shut out to ideas or people because with, without people, what are, you, what are you doing? Where are you going? Where you got to pour into? No, we are in the business of people, right? And that's how God made it. We need each other. God made it that way. There is no rich person, no famous person, no smart person that has arrived at that place on their own. There's always someone beside them, someone who poured into them, and we must be the same. None of us are on an island to ourselves. Paul being led of the Spirit, um, I mean, sorry, Epaphras being led of the Spirit sought out Paul. They want to do a, a real good leader, a real godly minister. That person wants to seek what is right over what they want. That person does not put their desires before God. That person wants to do what God says is right versus what they think is right. They do not seek to uplift themselves, but they seek to uplift of um seek to uplift others. A true minister of God is basically kind of dead to themselves. Their desires are not their own. Their desires are of God and what God thinks is right. And these are the type of things that you want to look for when you are looking for uh, either a new church or you're looking at your, your pastor, your minister, your leader, whoever it is. Is this person putting God's word first? Is this person putting what God says first? Because that is what a true minister does. A true minister wants to see the growth of people. They don't want to sit there and just puff themselves up and put themselves in the front line. They want to see other people grow. Other people get into the kingdom of God and do the, the thing better than them. You know? And so that is what Epaphras wants. That's why he's going to Paul. Paul is above him. Paul knows more than him. So he's saying, what can I glean from this man to bring back to the people that God has given me? And I pray that any minister or teacher, pastor, leader, that they are doing the same for the body of Christ out there. And if he or she is not doing that, I'm telling you to pray for them. And if they still don't continue, go to them. If they still don't continue, you might need to leave. Because you don't want to be under bad leadership. That's the worst thing that we could do. Because we are all called, whether in, we're all called in our own right to be leaders. And anything you do, whether it's parenting, working on a job, we should all be doing it for the kingdom of God. And if we're not doing it for the kingdom of God, we're doing it for ourselves. Woe to you. So, let's end on this note to do the things that we do, no matter what it is, for the kingdom of God. So, let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. Lord, and we, even though it was just an intro, Lord, it was just packed with so much. And I just thank you, Lord, for ministering to our spirits, Lord. I pray that all the words that we heard today, Lord, that they are hidden in our hearts and that we marinate on those things for the whole week, Lord, just in our spirits, seeing how can we live out the kingdom of God? How can we live as kingdom citizens, Lord? And so we thank you for your guidance this week. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that we're coming to you in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. If there is something in this message that you kind of heard and you have some questions about, what did you think about this message? Was it a good message? Was it a bad message? You didn't like what I said. Or maybe you have something else you would like to add. Please put it in the comment section below. We want to hear from you. If there is, uh, you know, a way that, you know, if the Holy Spirit is just kind of leading you to give to this ministry, you want to make sure that we can keep as many things in this ministry free for everyone. But there are costs associated with this ministry that I cannot get around. And so if the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to donate, please feel free. I'll put all the donate information in the description box. Please partner with us just to get the word of God out. Partner with us to grow this ministry. And we thank you and we bless you and we'll talk to you later. Peace. Mm -hmm.